Father in heaven, we are like the Greeks who came at the end of Christ's ministry and said we would see Jesus. As we open the word now, we, we pray that we will catch a glimpse of Jesus, maybe in a way we haven't seen before. Through the story that we're going to look at, we pray that he will be lifted up, and we know that if he is, he will draw all to himself. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The message I want to share with you today comes from the Old Testament. The Old Testament tells the story of Jesus. Jesus is the hero of history. He is the star of Scripture. And if you were to divide the Bible uh, between the Old and New Testaments, it would look something like this. And maybe most people think the story of Jesus is only in this half, the New Testament. But my, te my testimony is that the story is back here too, in the Old Testament. If you have what we might call the Emmaus perspective, what does that mean? Well, if you go to the story there in the book of Luke chapter 24, you remember that there were some travelers on the Sunday that Jesus rose from the grave, and they were very discouraged as they went along. They were joined by someone they didn't recognize, a stranger. And, uh, of course, it was the risen Lord. And as they came to their destination, he joined with them, and as he offered the blessing for the food, they recognized who he was. But what he told them was, he said, he, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And, of course, the scriptures that they had in that day were not the New Testament. It was the Old Testament. And so the story of Jesus is in the Old Testament. Well, we're going to find it today in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 4, and it concerns the ministry of Elisha. And Elisha bears out the story of Jesus in a remarkable way. Even his name bears the story of Jesus. It's Elisha, and that is God, my God is salvation. And we're looking today at the story found in 2 Kings 4, and the title of our message is Salvation in Shunem. Elisha lived perhaps eight centuries before Christ. He ministered to the northern kingdom the kingdom of Israel. This is after they split. And uh, the northern kingdom fell away into apostasy uh, more rapidly than the southern kingdom. Nevertheless, God was still reaching out to them, and in this case, through the ministry of Elisha, who was the successor, of course, of Elijah. And in, in this part of the story, I'm just going to read some verses here from 2 Kings chapter 4. It says, it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman and she constrained him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, that he turned in there to eat some food. Elisha was what we might call a circuit-riding preacher. He went from place to place as he uh, carried the word of God. His locus of uh, center was in Samaria, but he traveled around. And um, in this case, he went through this town of Shunem. We don't know exactly where that is. It was somewhere uh, near the Jezreel Valley. And here was this lady that... Uh, was there. She was married. It's interesting that she's the one that's called notable, though. Anyway, uh, as we view the story, there is one central picture that I hope uh, that, that will come clear to you, a picture of Jesus and salvation, a picture that was demonstrated by the song that Laura sang for us. But along the way, there are a couple other lessons that we can't just ignore, and one is that it says that uh, as Elisha was coming through, she constrained him to come in and eat some food. She exhibited hospitality. And, you know, the Bible says, do not be forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. It's a good Christian uh, principle to exemplify hospitality. And in this case, this little act of hospitality changed her life forever. Because as a result of that, as the story unfolds, you see what, you see what will happen. So Elisha would stop by there on his uh, tour of ministry and uh, he'd stop at the house there and eat some food. And then uh, the lady said to her husband, you know, we probably have some room that we can add on to our house and make a little room for him. And we could put a, a bed and a stool and a candlestick there. And uh, that can be his place to stay when he's coming through. So they did that. And when Elisha came through, he would uh, repair to that little, that little room and make it his home away from home. As the story, it says... Verse 11, it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and he lay down there. And then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite woman. So maybe he's laying there in his uh, uh, bed relaxing and 
He's pondering the, the gift of hospitality that this lady has shown through her kindness, and, and he tells his servant, Gehazi, go and get her. I, I have a question. So uh, when, he, when, he came, when she came in, she says, you've been so kind to us. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, what can we do for you? Uh, could I put a good word into the king for you or maybe could speak to the army commander and give your husband a promotion? Uh, and she says, no, I'm fine. And uh, uh, after she left, uh, Elisha said, well, there's got to be something we can do for her. And Gehazi, the servant, came up with uh, probably the correct answer. Gehazi answered, reading from verse 14, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. And probably like a light flash in Elisha's mind, that's it. This is what can be done for her. And so she came in again and uh, at his request. And as she stood there, Elisha said in verse 16, about this time next year, you are going to embrace a son. And she was, of course, flabbergasted, taken back, breathless. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, that's exactly what happened. Now, it's interesting that this uh, young boy that was born, uh, he's one of several miracle sons in the Bible. And you can make quite a list. There are at least seven that you can find, uh, beginning with uh, Isaac and uh, uh, Joseph and Samson and the Shunammite son. And, of course, John the Baptist. Jesus was a miracle birth as well. And they all have an interesting story. We'll talk about that perhaps another time. But um, here this little boy grows up, and he's the joy of their household. And like many little boys, uh, one day uh, dad's out working in the field, and he says, I want to go out there and, and work my, with my dad. And so he's out there, but it must be very hot that day. Maybe the child had a predisposition to some sort of illness. Anyway, he cried out, my head, my head. And he became uh, terribly ill. And uh, uh, he was taken back to his mom's, but uh, before the day was out, he expired. He died. And the light of, uh, of, uh, of joy that had come to that house through his birth was snuffed out by this tragedy at an early age. Her son was dead. What to do? Well, she had a donkey saddled, and she immediately went to see the prophet and uh, found him at Mark, Mount Carmel, still in chapter 4 of 2 Kings. Uh, Gehazi uh, is told by Elisha, look, here comes the Shunammite woman. Why don't you go out there and see if everything's okay? And he went out there, and, uh, uh, but she didn't want to talk to Gehazi. She kind of pushed him aside and went directly to the man of God and uh, uh, when she came there, she said, did I ask for a son from my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And Elisha perceived immediately what the problem was. The boy was dead. So he said to Gehazi, and now we're getting into the meat of this story, so pay careful attention to what's happening in the next couple of verses here. He said to Gehazi, get ready, take my staff in your hand, and go on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, do not answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. The mother of the child said, as, my, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead of them. He laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore, he went back to meet him and said, the child has not awakened. That's scene one, you might say. <laughs> That's not how the story ends, though. Then Elisha came. He came into the house. and There was the child lying dead on his bed. He went in, Elisha went in. He shut the door behind the two of them and he prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands. He stretched himself out on the child and the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. This, I'm going to submit to you, is a picture of salvation. Salvation in Shunem. This is a picture of Jesus. What do we have in this story? Well, we have a young man. And that young man can stand for any individual person. It could stand for possibly a young person. But I believe it also stands for all of humanity. All of humanity is this boy. And the boy contracted a, a deadly illness of some sort and passed away. How, we ask ourselves, how can life come back in this situation? How can this boy be brought back to the living? How can he be re resurrected? Well, one technique would be to send somebody else and have the staff, the rod, and put it on his face. 
And we can think of this staff as being perhaps the rod of correction or discipline. <coughs> and maybe some people try to uh, bring life to humanity or to youth through correction and through discipline. Uh, but that's not what brought life in this case. The boy was still dead. What was the technique, though, we find that did work in this case? Well, it wasn't by sending somebody else. It wasn't by sending a servant. It was by the prophet coming himself. And what did the prophet do? The prophet went there. We're using Elisha as a type, an illustration of Jesus and his method of bringing life to the dead. He says, he went up there and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. When this world got into trouble, God didn't send somebody else. He came himself. When Jesus was born, the Bible says that he was going to be given a name. And that name was Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, there might have been many angels that would have liked to have come and uh, helped out planet Earth. But that would not have brought life. It was only when God himself came and became a part of the human family that life came. I'm reading now from the first chapter of John that describes this uh, experience, this miraculous experience. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, God, was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And then going down to verse 14, it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the story of Shunem, sending Gehazi the servant, sending Gehazi with the staff, uh, didn't bring life. But when the prophet came himself and put his hands where the boy's hands were, and put his mouth where the boy's mouth was, in his eyes. Then life came. And that's what God did. God came to this planet. And he put his hands where our hands are. And he spoke our language. And he saw things as we see them. And that's how salvation came to planet Earth. Reading from Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Beautiful passage that was written for our encouragement. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. It says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's the picture we find there in 2 Kings 4. When Elisha came and put his hands where the boy's hands were, touched the things that the young boy touched, saw what the young boy saw, spoke a language that he could understand. Then new life came. And that is exactly what Jesus did when he came here. Did he have to do that? Absolutely not. Uh, the, the miracle of Christ stepping from his throne, leaving his crown, leaving the adoration of angels that love to serve him and obey him, and come down to this darkened planet of sin is something that we can never really fathom or even understand or express. And yet this picture of Elisha going where the young boy was exhibits the love of God. Coming down to this planet, walking in our footsteps, seeing things from our perspective. And that's how salvation came to planet Earth. Now, in the story, it doesn't quite end there. First of all, it says that he stretched himself on the child. The flesh of the child became warm. And then he returned and walked back and forth in the house again. Even though God has provided the miraculous gift of salvation, for some of us that are a little more hardened in our habits of sin, it takes a little time, it takes a little effort. The planting of the gospel seed the, the first time may not take root, but God is patient. And he's willing to uh, expend the time and the energy uh, in our behalf to see if we will respond to his gift of salvation. And then it says something quite interesting. It says, after he stretched himself out on him, the child sneezed seven times, and then the child opened his eyes. Some people might say, why is it in the Bible? Why does it mention that he sneezed? I like to think of it this way. 
um, a sneeze is not the most pleasant of sounds. You can think of a lot of other sounds that are more pleasant. But I want to tell you that in that, in that bedroom, when that child sneezed, it was the most beautiful music that that mother ever heard in her life. That's what it meant to her. There's a saying that says, it's not what it is, it's what it means. And in this case, that child sneezing meant hope. It meant that the child was among the living again. It meant that her prayer was answered. And so it was beautiful, beautiful music to her ears, that sneeze. In life, we find that sometimes there are things that um, have to be interpreted to know whether they're good or bad. Um, where I live, we live out kind of in the country, and um, uh, there are critters around, there are rodents. We don't like them in our house, but it's not the easiest thing to control them. And so we have to do things to try to uh, keep that under control and uh, setting traps and whatever. So if you, go, if you were to go into the house and uh, uh, a, you, you've put the mouse trap out there with the bait on it and now you come back into the house later and you smell something, you, your first reaction might be that that's a putrid smell. Oh, that's a terrible smell. But actually it's not because it means that uh, your mission to rid your house of rodents is meeting with success. And so in that particular circumstance, uh, it, it doesn't smell bad, it smells good because your mission has been accomplished. And so when we begin our Christian journey, when we begin walking in the way of the Lord, we may not have everything perfect. We may not have all the pieces in place and we may not express the gospel in the clearest of tones and the best of diction, but the Lord knows, the Lord understands. It may be our sneeze of life that we're showing that we're on the right track and the Lord appreciates that very much. Jesus in the Old Testament, salvation in Shunem. Here's a boy that uh, had a miracle birth. He had a sudden death. How is he going to be raised back to life? It's not the rod of correction, but it is the prophet himself going, just as Jesus himself came to this earth and lived the life that we know. He became tired. He experienced hunger. He understood uh, rejection and betrayal. And that's why the song that Laura sang for us was so perfect, because when we have trials, we have temptations, there is someone that maybe nobody else in the world knows and understands our particular situation, but there is someone who does know, and that is Jesus. He came to this earth. He knows what it's like to live on this planet. Now, that story, that the song that Laura sang has a very interesting background. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but there was a young man, and he was engaged and it was the love of his life that he planned to marry the next day. But uh, tragically, she drowned and passed away on the eve of their wedding. And the young man, Joseph, uh, bore the burden of that sorrow and never overcame it, really. And he traveled from where he was on the continent to uh, the United States here. And his mother was um, very ill in Canada. He went to visit her. And as he was visiting with his mother, uh, he shared with her a poem that he had written that kind of expressed his, his journey through sorrow and, and finding solace and comfort in the Lord. And so he shared with her this poem, and uh, by the providence of God, that poem was put to music and uh, became the best-loved hymn that we now uh, 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 know so well, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. And that's possible because he came to this earth, he touched what we touched, he saw what we saw. He speaks our language. And what a thrilling thought to think that the one who sits on the throne of heaven knows and understands what our life is like. And there may be somebody watching our program that is going through a, a deep trial right now and is wondering, does anybody know what I'm going through? And I want to tell you that there is. Jesus came and he lived here. He knows, he understands, and he has help. Pray to him. Give your life to him. Ask him to come into your, into your life and show him show, so that he can show you his salvation. He has the answers where we, we, don't, we don't see them, but he does know. Salvation in Shunem. Whenever you hear this story, I hope you see Jesus in it because I believe that he is there. May God bless every single one of you. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like
like me. I once was lost, <coughs> but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come. T'was grace that taught me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there 10,000 years, Bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first be.
Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what pain we often bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield you. Thou will find a solace there.